I'm an old newspaper man, uh, something like the last Civil War veteran. Right out of college, barely 21 years old, uh, I started as a copy editor for my hometown newspaper, the Detroit Free Press. And every night at deadline time, 11 o'clock, I had to go back into the composing room to check to see that the final corrections had been made. And of course, the composing room back then was this kind of antediluvian sweatshop with these huge linotype machines, mm -hmm. uh, clank, clank, you know, casting every word of every story in molten lead. And uh, I had to lean over the hot lead to read the words in reverse image. And so now, to me as a writer, looking back, I thought, what great basic training that was. Learning the language backwards, forwards, and upside down, and as a physical presence that I could touch, and I could feel, I could smell, and I'd go home with ink on my fingers. And I thought, what, what a great way to start a romance. Uh, a few years later, when I was 24, I moved over to the Washington Post as a copy editor. And with a copy pencil in my hand, I was a whiz kid. But socially, I was way out of my league. Uh, the editor-in-chief was the famous Ben Bradley, JFK's wingman. And he was so handsome and self-assured and suave and polished and well-bred and witty. And all of the senior editors were uh, uh, entitled Ivy Leaguers. And I was just this middle-class dork from Wayne State University in downtown Detroit. And I felt it in every bone in my body. My childhood stutter started coming back. Uh, my, my, my greatest fear was that I would go into the bathroom. They just had two urinals there, side by side, nothing between them. My greatest fear was I'd go into the bathroom and Bradley would pull up next to me. <laughs> and he'd say something just incredibly clever, and I would be tongue-tied for a response. Plus, I'd have stage fright and wouldn't be able to do what I came in there to do. <laughs> so, uh, I figured this wasn't working out. So I got this crazy idea to quit the post and go to some tropical island far, far away and figure out what to do with the rest of my career. Uh, my wife at the time, Carol, was game. We had two kids, three and four. So I hijacked them to this poor West Indian fishing village, which was the last village at the farthest end of the last island in the Caribbean. And my fantasy was that I would sit under the cocoa palms with the local Rastas and perhaps smoke a little ganja and get a whole new picture of what life was all about. Uh, the reality was that after about three days, Carol got an ear infection. Uh, we didn't have a car. The whole idea was to live simply. Uh, there was only one doctor on that whole end of the island. She had to hitchhike there. And it, when she got there at 3 in the afternoon, he was drunk. <laughs> so she came back to our cottage and said, what are we doing bringing these precious two children down here and risking their lives on the off chance that you're going to find a little enlightenment? And uh, she had a good point. <laughs> she had a good point. So we moved back to Washington, and I thought, well, maybe I should try my hand at writing. Uh, I'd been editing other people's stuff all this time. Maybe I had something to say. Uh, so the Post hired me back as a human interest feature writer, and it, it went very well. Uh, and then in the next year, 1972, there were two, two historic events took place in the newsroom of the Post. One was the Watergate investigation by those two guys, uh, what was his name? <laughs> well, uh, Woodward Bernstein, yeah, that's right. Uh, the other one was an investigation I conducted myself into the literary benefits of smoking a joint in the company car on the way back to the office from an assignment. <laughs> and the results of that experiment were my stories had more of a poetic liftoff. They were friskier, they were more playful, they were deeper in some ways. And best of all, Ben Bradley kept putting him on page one. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I have this huge advantage over the other writers. Uh, and I thought, well, why would I, why would I ever give that up? 
And the answer is, I haven't.